Good evening and welcome to our Sunday night Bible study. We're going to talk tonight in our fifth lesson on the life of Abraham. And we're going to be turning in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 16. Now we've talked about that in human history, typically history is, quote, written by the victors. And so therefore, oftentimes when recounting maybe great political leaders or others who have influenced the thought of societies, people that are looked up to and we want to remember fondly, our histories will engage in what is called heroification, where you take a hero and you kind of accentuate the good that they've done, the noble ideas or philosophies or deeds, and you, you know, kind of water down or even at times totally ignore a recounting of their weaknesses, of their shortcomings. Well, the Word of God is different than all human history in that God does not engage in heroification. Whether it's a man who is after God's own heart or Peter the rock, as Jesus would call him, or Paul the great apostle, the Bible is clear about the weaknesses and shortcomings even of its greatest heroes. And that is going to be true all throughout the life of even the father of faith, the friend of God, Abraham. And here in chapter 16, Abraham is going to do something, rationalize something in a way that is common to humanity and God's servants throughout time. He is tempted and he yields to that temptation to take God's commandments and rather than just be obedient, regardless if he likes the commandment or not, if he, if he agrees with it or not, rather than just be obedient, he'll take that commandment and he'll change it and obey it on his own terms. The thing is, though, is if we obey and we change it to what we really wanted the instruction to be in the first place, that isn't obedience at all. It isn't submission at all. It's simply working the situation to be what we want it to be. And Abraham gives us a, a stellar example of exactly what that submission to self rather than submission to God is here in Genesis chapter 16. It also talks a little bit about what it means to be patient and to wait on God. Abraham had been made some outrageous promises by God. He'd been told that even though he was an old, old man, that he would still have a son and that that son would grow and from him would be a great people and that even all the nations of the world would be blessed. It seemed impossible. But Abraham trusted God. He knew it wasn't impossible for God. But rather than waiting for God to see that promise fulfilled in God's timing, in God's way, he and his wife Sarai, they run ahead of God. And that's recorded here in chapter 16. Now, another character that we're going to be introduced to here is Hagar. And Hagar's life, I'll tell you, of all the Old or New Testament characters, Hagar is one of the ones that my heart always goes out to the most. Although she's always a side character in the story of Abraham and Sarah, she is one of the most heartbroken people. And we can see it as we read the text, but more importantly, the text is abundantly clear that God sees her pain, her struggle, and her suffering. So let's dive in and read verses 1 through 6 of Genesis chapter 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go to my servant, and it may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarai. And after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abraham, her husband, as a wife, and went into Hagar. And she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be to you. I gave you my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked upon me with contempt. 
may the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. Now, this first section of six verses tells us how Sarai and Abraham run ahead of God, how they insert in God's commandment their own way of making that commandment be fulfilled, their own twist, their own desires, and how their impatience causes them to run ahead of God. Unexpected things result as they often do when we try to play God. God had made a promise and had a destiny for their lives. And we need to pay attention to that because the scriptures doesn't, don't isolate that idea of destiny and purpose and God's desire for us to simply the named heroes of the Bible. In fact, when we look over in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 13 through 17 Paul will write, he says, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you as believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. And you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out to displease God and to oppose all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon you at last. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored more earnestly with great desire to see you face to face. You see, he talks there about how God had a plan for the Thessalonians. Now, these evil men, these evil doers, they came in to thwart that plan. But God has made a promise and he has a destiny for each and every one of us. Think of all the promises that have been made to you and made to me. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That God will work all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That we can do all things through Christ who gave us strength. We could go on and on and on. The Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, those are a list of God's promises of blessings. If we'll just but be the kind of servants he's asked us to be. God has made his promises. He has a destiny for us. He has a, a will that we be his children, that we be his ambassadors. But when we run ahead and think we can take God's promises and insert our own will in those and do it our way, rather than fully, completely, submissively his way, oh, then we're not really being obedient at all. We're just serving ourselves. Yet the problem for them and often for us is they couldn't wait upon the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, Isaiah says, But they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. There's great value in being patient because patience, and when it comes to God and trusting his promises, patience is faith. Patience is a demonstration of trust. And even though Abram was the father of faith and Sarai was his wife and, and a mother of faith in so many ways, they had this shortcoming. They ran ahead. They didn't have in this instance the faith the trust in God, to wait on Him to see His promises fulfilled. Which leads us to verses 17 through 16. And you know how this story plays out. We we'll kind of read parts of it, but we've already seen the tragedy of Hagar in this text. You'll notice that, and I don't want to be too graphic or, or try to be overly critical of Abram and Sarai, but the Bible is clear they didn't consider her will at all. 
Sarah simply just said to Abram, go take my maidservant. Where's the question to her? Where's the wonder how she feels about this? They, they didn't care. And then after exactly what they planned and plotted to come to pass, after that came to pass, Sarah, she's not satisfied with it. She's not happy with it. She's bitter. And she complains to Abram. And you know what his response is? Now, technically, under their customs, the, now Hagar is his wife also. But when Sarah complains, Abram says, do what you want with her. In essence, I don't care. Now, that breaks my heart. And I think about that poor lady. And then as we read through... It says that the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, verse 7. But you'll notice that it said in verse 6, Abram said to Sarai, so Sarai dealt harsh with her and she fled. So here she is. She has nothing. She's a slave. She's been mistreated and abused. And then the one man that now she's his wife, he doesn't even care what happens to her. And now she runs away and all she can do is weep. In the wilderness, the angel came to her and it says, he says, Hagar, servant of Sarai, why have you come from here? Where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. And the angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so they cannot be numbered for a multitude. And then the angel continued to talk to her. And then verse 13 so she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God of seeing. For she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Now in this we see that God worked it out. Even though his servants had run ahead, even though they had a lack of faith, even though they did it their own way, even though they mistreated somebody, God still worked it out. Because in verse 15, it says, And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar, Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So in the midst of Hagar's misery, we see God care for, get this, all of them. For Hagar, the one who's mistreated, for Abram and Sarai, the ones who mistreated her and ran ahead of God and had a lack of faith, God cares for all of them. And although they had done wrong, God still worked it out for good in the end. Just as it tells us in Romans chapter 8, that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Even when our mistakes are our own fault sometimes, even though we've done it to ourselves as Abram and Sarai had done, God still blesses them with Ishmael and he'll bless them with Isaac, the son of promise. Hagar was mistreated and abused, but she receives a son and indeed her son does exactly what the angel promises happens. He becomes a great leader and a great nation and brings his mother honor. So God can still work it out. And when I've made mistakes, when you've made mistakes, what a comfort that is to know that God, when we turn back to him and like Abram and Sarai, they didn't turn away from God, even though they had run ahead and had a lack of faith, they still continued to serve him. God worked all things together for the good of those who love him. Now, when I look at Hagar and her interaction with particularly the angel of the Lord, the verse that I, I, I'll never forget because it always impacts me, especially when I see people are hurt and mistreated. I always think of these words that she says in verse 13. She called the name of the Lord. You are a God of seeing. Some versions say, you are the God who sees me. For she said, truly, here I am seeing, I've seen him who looks after me. And that's, Kind of the last thing I want to point out from this text tonight is that sometimes people feel so mistreated, they feel alone, they feel like nobody cares. And sometimes it's even true, as it was with Hagar. But if we could just see beyond, see with the eyes of faith, we serve a God with whom we are never alone. We see a God who sees the real us, the real pain, the real mistreatment. And we see a God who cares. When nobody else sees you, 
He is the God who sees you. When nobody else sees me, he is the God who knows. He is the God who cares. So I pray that you'll take that with you this week. You know, as we look at this, there's so many lessons to learn. We know that we shouldn't run ahead of God. We have to trust him. The greatest exercise of faith sometimes is to wait on him. But we can know that even when we've made mistakes and the problems in our life are our own fault, which many, many times they are, that God can still, if we'll continue to turn to him in faith, he can still even work that out. But we also can know that when we feel at our worst, when life has its beat down, when we feel that nobody cares and nobody sees, we have a God who sees us and who cares. I hope that you have a great week. I'm sure this weather won't last so long that we won't be able to come back together again and also be able to share with those who, because of the, because of the pandemic, have to worship online. We love every one of you. And we pray for you. God bless.